my MBA was really two years of realization of all the things I did. I thought I knew, but I didn't. And I think it was the the key point in my career, and luckily it happened early enough in my career where I realized that I, I have so much to learn. Carl, thank you so, so much for joining us today on Demo Day. Thanks, Sean. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, you're very welcome. So my first question, Carl, is, you know, we have investors come on the show from all different types of verticals in venture, whether it be deep tech, you know, uh, fintech, consumer tech. And what I really loved about learning about M13 is that you guys focus on the future of consumer behavior. And you really are trying to learn about the sorts of technologies that will drive consumer behavior in the next five to 10 years. And so my first question for you is, why this vertical? Why is this a passion of yours? When you could have gone so many different directions, why is it the, the consumer behavior and technology that uh, you find to be the most uh, fulfilling for you? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I think, the most creative part of, um, for me at least, of, of, you know, the startup world and kind of the developing community. It's all about how a human's going to interact with technology as it grows into the future. You know, we all dream of the sci-fi movies, especially the ones that are near future, you know, 2030, 2040, 2050. And you see all the ways in which humans react with technology or interact with technology. And it's just, you know, it's kind of this boyhood passion of just trying to understand, you know, how are things going to change? Um, when you look at our lives 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, the, and you actually sit down and really look at what did I have 10 years ago? What did I have 20 years ago from a technology standpoint? Uh, our lives are so oriented around everything that surrounds us, all the things that empower us to do what we do. Um, to be able to live in a world where you are able to kind of make predictions and, and start thinking about how different technology is going to affect individual people. It just from a passion perspective, it's super exciting. Now, um, I, were you were you always a technology lover growing up? Like, do you remember when your parents first introduced a computer to you, or, or were you on your own at the point when you started to first like play with computers and get to see what they were like? Yeah, I mean, it was a Commodore sixty four was my first wow. one, and I remember I, I don't know how old I was. I was a little kid, but. Um, my sister and I would sit there and we'd be designing these games of our own on the Commodore 64. And it would be like, I mean, we were, I don't know, 10 years old or something, but it would be literally, you know, pick the color on the pixel on the page and create like a path of learning, you know, a maze, which you have to navigate through by answering questions. Most simple thing in the world. But, you know, right off the bat, that was just really interesting to me uh, as a little kid and just kind of being able to play with that. It's, to, you know, to any kid now that's kind of playing with iPads at the age of five, it's a totally different world. But, but when I was a kid, that was exciting for me. And, and I always grew up in, in you know, a mathematics, physics, kind of science, um, uh, you know, construct and went to engineering school, did electrical electronic engineering back in the early 90s. So I've always been very technical uh, from, a, from a mental perspective and, and it definitely always been inspired by how technology changes the world. Were, were you the sort of kid in elementary school, middle school that was really self-motivated to go into engineering and technology? Or was it really your parents that had a bigger influence? Like what, what was the driving factor that got you at an early age into that sort of a, a thought process? Yeah, it's an interesting question. My dad was an engineer by training. Uh, he was a businessman, but he was an engineer by training. And I think I always, I think it was just organic for me. I just always you know, um, thought in a very logical way, always very comfortable with sciences. It was just a very natural thing for me. I don't think that when I was growing up in the 80s, um, I was as exposed to programming and, and you know, com specifically computer technologies. I think I began to understand that more at when I went to university. Um, the world you know, at least where I was, wasn't as inundated as obviously it is today with kind of how, how powerful engineering is as a medium for people to really create and innovate. And when you, uh, where'd you grow up again, Carl? 
I grew up in London. Grew up in London. London, England. Now, yeah. was there like when you were starting to go into you know high school and and college? Was there a technology scene? Uh, was that something that people like even thought about going into computer science back then, or did that evolve after you got out of college? Yeah, it, it really computer science wasn't a thing. It, it um, you know people didn't really think about it. I, I was uh, um, I know I was. Um, when I went to college, I was introduced to this Unix Sun Station, which was this like the most powerful computer, you know, possible or whatever they called it at the time. Right now, it's you know, you know, I don't know what <laughs> CPU comparable it would be, but but it's like probably the same, you know, a lower CPU than I have on my watch. But um, but that was the you know I did I kind of built a neural network as my you know college thesis. I was doing like heavy computing. Wait, you built time. a neural and network when you were back in college? Yeah, that was my that was my project. My my uh, I, I basically simulated a neural network which had like some recognition recognition algorithms. It could scan photos, turn them into zeros and ones, and then create a recognition profile based upon who it was looking at. But that again, very rudimentary yeah. version of something that happens every day today. But back in the early nineties, it was like you know novel, you know leading edge technology. I, I mean, but, I feel like even today, when you have a conversation with a, a peer that's maybe not in the investing startup world, the concept of neural networks is still a very advanced concept to really comprehend. But I could imagine that you know twenty years ago, thirty years ago, it was it was probably your friends were probably like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" You know, like. Yeah. yeah, I didn't even I didn't even talk to my friends about it. <laughs> <laughs> it was me, me and my peer advisor, and that was about as far as it wow. went. No, it's actually you know I, I you know I cannot compare anything I did to anything that people are looking at today. But I would say that it was a bleeding edge part of it was kind of you could see papers being written about it at that time, and so I was basically taking what I was reading in these papers and trying to create a you know com computer you know kind of a software equivalent process that would run like a neural network and so i it was successful it worked i was able to you know i take 10 photos of you with beard without beard like glasses hat whatever and it would be able to pick you out uh, out of a thousand photos wow. um, based upon the learning that it had from every time it saw a different image of you wow. um but uh but it was really really you know obviously the most basic form and it was you know it was basically converting everything into zeros and ones and just recognizing patterns. And that's how it was working, but through a neural network. So it was able to store a significant amount more knowledge than a typical, you know, storage solution would be able how, to, how did, to store. How did you transition your engineering mindset into a business savvy? At, like, at what point did you decide that you wanted to start to transition and become a, you know, a business owner? I know that uh, you, I believe yeah. you started your first company in the '90s, but at, at what point did you know that you wanted to become an actual operator yourself? Uh, pretty much right out of college. So I, I enjoyed the engineering, and I did like uh, some summer jobs and stuff, working you know on pretty pretty challenging engineering projects. But at the end of the day, I never. I think maybe because of the exposure I had, I didn't really recognize at the time I came out of college. You know the what was going on in Silicon Valley and, mm. you know, all the things that were happening in, in the tech world. And so I came out and actually worked for a larger engineering company for a couple of years, but took more of a sales engineer slash business development. In route. America or still in and London? In the mm. US. I moved to LA and I did it in LA and I did that for about three years and actually did really well. I was really good at kind of closing deals, really good at, you know, the whole kind of sales engineering process and kind of just the operational process. And so um, it kind of fell in my lap um, in the late 90s, uh, 97, you know, people really started to feel I was in L.A. now in California. I was, you know, beginning to get, you know, bleeding from from uh, from north of us. Um, this whole concept of, you know, the world is changing. People are building businesses. This is as good a time as any to ever start and try and build something. And myself and three friends um, decided we were going to build we we're going to build a business and it was basically centered around camera technology. Um, but we were going to build a business. And for some reason, the four of the four of us, they kind of pushed me forward and said, you, you run it, you'd be the boss, you, you know, you'd be the CEO. And so, um, I, you know, co-founder of that business ended up essentially running that business. And we, 
we did well. We raised money. I had no idea what I was doing from a business standpoint. So I hadn't done any business courses in in college. I really had done a pure engineering um, degree. The business I had been in uh, before I started this didn't give me any exposure to you know all the basics of of kind of building a company. They would just you know go out and make deals, and so. I, you know, at the time I was running everything off my gut, but later as I began to learn things and when I went to do my MBA and stuff, it was just all these aha moments of just realizing that I didn't really know anything mm. when I was in my 20s. It was just all learning and kind of grasping um, at mentors and, and people around me to help advise me and help me figure out, you know, what decisions to make. And I got lucky, you know, I got through and got lucky, went through some rough times with the bubble and stuff, but um, ultimately was able to exit that business and, uh, and it was just, you know, the, it kind of, um, seeded, you know, the excitement that I had about really getting into, you know, getting into building businesses is, it's kind of a, a lifelong passion. And after you, after you exited your first business, did you immediately think to yourself, I want to go and move into VC and into venture and investing, or was this kind of. Uh, was there a journey for you to get to that point? Because we're still in the early, you know, late nineties, early two thousands at this point. Yeah. And, and the yeah. landscape so is so much different then than it is today. Yeah. So I, I exited my business in 2000 in and around the bubble era, which had its pros and its cons, but um, I stayed with the company for another year, brought on a new CEO, kind of did a full transition. And then the following year, I actually went to Columbia to do an MBA. And so my thought when I was going to Columbia was, hey, this is a, you know, this is the experience I've had. This is my point in time. I think it was 28 at the time. Uh, I have an opportunity now to figure out what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. So actually, I did look at VC at that time. I actually went to work um, for a VC the following summer. Uh, and uh, this is early 2000s, just, you know, this is 2000, the summer of 2002. Um, so I did a summer internship at a VC and uh, kind of just worked with them for one summer. And really, I think what I came out of that with was um, I had so much more to learn. I felt like even back then I had this niggling feeling like if you really want to be a good investor, you kind of have to, you have to go through the operating experience to really, really understand the people you're investing mm. in and how you're going to help them and how you're going to work with them. And I, I don't, I wouldn't say it was like a clear, clear, uh, point of view at that point, but it definitely, I, I felt it. And I felt like, I don't think I'm ready to do this right now. I feel like I need to build more. And so, um, you know, that, so dabbled in that one internship, but the main thing, what, the main thing it just uh, reminded me of is I need to go out, build one or two more businesses and actually, you know, gain more experience. And I'd learned so much through my MBA, funnily enough, that I realized that everything I'd done in my previous company was basically wrong. <laughs> and so, you know, I was like, let me go put this in practice. And actually, you know, now that I know how to read a financial statement properly, now that I understand the basic mechanics of marketing, now that I, you know, all this basic theory doesn't mean anything unless I put it in practice and really learn it. And so, um, you know, I spent the next 15 odd years or more, so I guess 17 years, um, you know, in, in the business space before I finally mm. made the formal transition of 1013. Now, it sounds like, like Will, I, I want to talk more about, you have some really interesting processes and different theses within M13 that I think is really cool. One of the things that you talk about is how your fund has kind of two different types of investments. You have like your core investments, and then you have your, you know, basically your seed, your seed uh, feeder investments, I think is what you called them. And my question is for the feeder companies, the ones that are a little bit early, not your core, but the ones that you really believe in the founder, how much of it do you believe, like how much of it is the grit, the sales, the figuring it out on the fly, and how much of it is the MBA, they have a certain pedigree. You know, when you're looking at these founders, how much do you weigh their street smarts versus kind of their school smarts? And, and how does that play into your decision making? Yeah, um, it's interesting because I think it's a different thing for every founder. I would say to you, my gut reaction to, to you asking that question is it is much more about potential than it is about, um, you know, education or, you know, past experience. Like you meet someone who's building a business, especially at a feeder level where you're only, you know, investing a few hundred thousand dollars. 
you're generally dealing with people that have not built businesses before. Mm. You know, usually if you've had success, you're going to go straight to a larger round. You're going to have relationships in the investment community. It's going to be different. So a lot of our feeder um, investments are into entrepreneurs who are first time founders. They may have operated or done things before, but they're first time founders. And I think the biggest thing that we're always looking for is just where's the potential Do these people really like how excited do we get around this individual you know not only um do they have you know their own kind of self-starter potential but also you know do they have a certain level of humility you know can they be coached can we help them um can we help create an amazing founding team out of you know the the beginnings that they've built and so uh, we have met people like we've come out of meetings the thinking of a couple of key investments we made in these early stages and we'll come out of a meeting and there'll be a you know early 20s founder and you know me and whoever came was in the meeting with me uh whoever my partner is just look at each other and go that person's great you know that person has real potential and then you start thinking hey do we want to back them do we want to get behind them in some cases it's purely about the people but in other cases it's also about I think you've got something, you know, I think you've got a great idea. It's not validated yet. So I can't go and pile in millions of dollars into you, but I want to help mm-hmm. you take the next step because if you can validate this, then there's a real exciting business behind it. And we want to give you guys a chance to, to prove that. And so those are some of the principles of how we think of these feeder, feeder positions. Yeah, that, I mean, it makes a lot of sense because I think that a lot of the startups at the very early stage, especially at that feeder stage, all they're thinking about is getting that getting that check, that, that small milestone that has a very finite end to it. Whereas from your point of view, you, I mean, I'm sure everyone feels this way, but you're looking at it as a marriage, something that's going to last for such a long time that you really have to develop that relationship and, and trust that this is not something that is going to just go away in six months or a year, but that you can see yourself really growing with this person for years to come. I, I love what you talked about around this idea of investors as a platform versus investors as like a banker. And I know, you know, Andreessen Horowitz was really one of the first people to uh, kind of think about this as a platform. But, you know, in all of the research I've done for this, I really enjoy hearing your perspective. And so maybe you can um, talk to uh, our audience that maybe has never heard of M13 before. Can you talk a little bit more about the idea of both the feeder and then the core, you know, what size funds M13 is and maybe just a very uh, broad context of who you guys are and what you focus on? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're about $185 million fund. Um, we invest mainly in series a, um, our average, and that's our main core investments. Our average investment, um, is around three and a half to 4 million, but we, you know, we'll do more than that. You know, it's gone up to seven or $8 billion in our investments and we've got as small as one to 2 million. Um, we will lead, we will follow, you know, we'll be part of a syndicate. Um, so we're happy to, to, you know, come in, uh, with our core investment, we'd like to take a certain amount of ownership because we think it validates the work. And I'll explain in a little bit, uh, what we mean by that, but the work we, we want to do and the resources we want to offer. Um, we basically really believe in the idea that it's not just capital we're investing, but it's also our knowledge, our resources. Um, and as we speak a bit more about what M13 does, you know, your, your audience will hopefully recognize that. There's a lot more value in the things that are provided around the capital than in the capital itself. And I think that's the future of, of VC. On the feeder side, we do, you know, average check size probably around half a million dollars. We'll go up to maybe a million on a feeder check. Um, and we generally will get in at a seed or early seed stage and, and kind of look at a company that is pre-Series A that's looking to kind of grow into a multi-million dollar round. We We'll get in early. We'll help the founders. You know, we've got a couple of great examples where we had investments, um, small investments, and then followed in in the next round with a lead check or something much more meaningful. And so, um, you know, that's an exciting outcome for us because it proves that, you know, we made a good bet, right, you know, at a very early stage in the business to to kind of support and and help the founders get up the curve. I I mean, I love it. One of the things that you've said before that I think is, you know, it's so hard to do it in real time, but it makes so much sense is this idea of like, you should be fundraising when you don't need to fundraise. And that as a founder, you know, it's all about consistently building these relationships. And I just love how you guys have actually built it into your model of knowing that, 
you know, investing is such a long-term relationship and process by doing these feeder uh, uh, deals, you're able to not just uh, do your due diligence and do your, you know, kind of fact checking, but really see how the vibe is, see how you feel, see what the numbers look like. And I think it's such a cool way of, you know, uh, really bringing in a nice big follow up round is to first know how that team interacts with each other. Um, yeah. Now, when yeah, yeah it, def it definitely makes it definitely makes decision making easier, right? When you've been uh, working with a company for a year or so, and then you get the opportunity to put a bigger check in, it makes yeah. the whole process just as a hell of a lot easier. So absolutely. And now, speaking about the process, like the thing is, is I haven't had too many VCs on the podcast that if they have these sorts of processes, would love to learn more about them. But you have such an interesting way of you have your committee, you have your partners, you have the pitching, maybe talk to, you know, someone that's never heard of M13 before. If you're a founder that maybe wants to get involved, what's like the general process that goes through? What does that look like for people that want to learn more about you guys? Yeah, um, we uh, so I mean, the first thing we do is uh, obviously the connection point. So um, how do founders submit their information to us? How do they connect to us? Um, you know, the idea is that it will come through one of our partners in one way or the other and, and we'll end up getting the deck and the story and some kind of information about the founders. We really work as a team in terms of investment decisions. So a lot of VC firms um, have a very individual approach where individuals kind of run their own book of business, their own portfolios. We really work as a horizontal team. So we generally pull people in earlier. And uh, again, that, there's a reason for that in terms of how um, these investments play out after we've given the check. So, um, you know, once we have information, you know, we will assess internally if it fits our thesis, if we think it's interesting, you know, we'll begin the process of just initiating conversation and getting into more detail. We generally invite um, the founders, if we're interested in a business, to come and pitch to our full investment team. We do that on Mondays. And then following that, again, if there's a consistent interest, then we can move very quickly to kind of complete our diligence process and ultimately get to a term sheet, you know, within probably a couple of weeks after that point. So. We tend to move relatively quickly. We do like to um, build a relationship and get to know our founders. We, we are, you know, there are, again, other investors that perhaps will make investments um, much more readily off of a short demo or of a short um, uh, presentation. We tend to, even in hot deals, even if we're risking missing deals, we tend to are on the side of wanting to know the founders better. Uh, and because again, it's a marriage, and uh, and I think a lot of I've experienced myself bad investments where I've taken money from someone I don't really know well enough, and as a result, ended up in a in a less comfortable situation in terms of investor relationship. So um, that's you know that's the way we approach it. We approach it as a mm -hmm. as a relationship. One of the key things just to kind of begin to elaborate to the other side of the uh, you know of the coin for us. One of the key things is we obviously have um, a bench of incredible operating executives that work within the fund, that partners within the fund. And their focus is not on driving investments, but rather driving the success of founding teams once we've made the investment. And they're involved in the investment process because their, their point of view is to establish either expertise in a particular vertical, a particular capability, which relates to the company, or more important, identifying how we can be most helpful once we've made the investment. So you know, what, what are the things that we know we can do or any introductions we can make or the strategic points of view that we might have that can be incredibly helpful to the founding teams. And in most investments we make, we like to go in with a point of view of how we can be, uh, you know, a meaningful impact in that, in that company's success going forward rather than, uh, you know, um, taking a back seat and just not being involved at all in, in, you know, in what they're doing to grow. So I definitely want to learn more about what it means to be an active investor in an active VC platform versus a passive. But one of the questions that I have been excited to ask you, uh, you know, our, our, our guy, Mike Tyson, always says everyone's got a plan until you get punched in the throat. And right now we're all getting punched in the throat by COVID. There's so much uncertainty. And so I, I'm curious, knowing that, you know, you guys have a process in a business as usual environment. What do you do when like deals are quote unquote hot, but you don't necessarily have the opportunity like right now to do your normal process, whether that be meeting them for, 
dinner or bringing them into the office. Um, you know, I obviously could imagine that um, having first or second meetings is not an, an issue for virtual. But what about as you get deeper into due diligence and you really have to think about writing these big checks? How has your mentality changed? Has it changed at all? Um, maybe talk to us a little bit about um, how your overall process has had to evolve since COVID has you know, made some of these hurdles happen. Yeah, I mean, the biggest uh, change, as you highlighted, is just the amount of face time and the amount of uh, you know, personal time you get with individuals. I will say, um, even when I was in DigitalOcean, we built such a remote culture that um, at least I and I think most of the team have, have gotten comfortable building relationships digitally, which is an unusual thing, right? A lot of people have to really make adjustments to, to make that work. So I would say that we are actively looking at some really interesting investments and there are, you know, there are relationships in there that we're making a point of building, but building digitally because we can't necessarily do them face to face. Do you, um, I, I want to, I want you to keep expanding, but you, you've got my head kind of spinning with, with questions, which is like, does that play into your assessment now? Do you try to assess the culture of a team virtually now and how they interact? You know, for example, my team as an agency I could have never imagined that we would be able to continue working at full capacity if we're not hitting the whiteboard together or having our meetings together. And I've learned that it's actually quite possible with the right systems in place. Um, do you take that into account or does it, is that just not something that's of importance uh, when you're kind of thinking about due diligence? Yeah, I think it's, listen, I think it's generally very, very important. I, I think we have a couple of things working in our favor here. First of all, um, at least myself and these couple of the other partners come from environments of highly distributed teams. So we have operated very, very effectively in highly distributed teams, either with multiple offices or a lot of, uh, you know, individuals that work remotely in, in a distributed fashion. And we've been able to build relationships and execute and perform at a very high level in those environments. So we come to the table with a lot of that experience. Um, the fund itself is set up in Los Angeles. We have offices in New York and we have a partner in San Francisco. And so a huge amount of our day-to-day -day activity is actually done digitally mm -hmm. and done virtually. So we already, you know, every investment meeting we have, we have people in different locations. Everybody is synced through digitally. Not everybody's always in the same room. So there's a lot of natural aspects of how you operate in a in a distributed environment that we already practice yeah. and we already understand really, really well. So when I look at a team and I look at a company, um, the first thing in my mind is not, can they operate in a distributed fashion? Because I know that anybody can, because I've done it. It's more of a question of um, how, you know, can they, uh, how adaptable are they? Are they able to learn? Are they able to grow? Are they able to evolve? Are they able to tackle challenges like the COVID challenge, you know, in full stride? You know, there's a lot of um, leadership skills and capabilities that you just inherently assess as you're getting to know these individuals. And to me, I think uh, I would, I, I like to think that I would recognize very quickly if, you know, something like a distributed workforce would be a big challenge yeah. for, you know, for a particular team. What sort of... Um, I don't think as yet it's been an issue that we've looked at and said, oh, these guys are great, but there's no way they can work in a distributed fashion. That hasn't really been an issue for us today. What sort of qualities do you believe rise to the top in leadership? Like what, what, what should leaders be focused on right now? When you have your advisory or your mentorship meetings with your CEOs, what sort of advice are you giving them to lead their troops through this storm? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I've been through a couple of storms myself. I had a fintech company in 2008 that we navigated through. And wow. obviously my first company we talked about earlier was uh, right in the middle of the tech bubble. <laughs> so I, I've been through that a couple of times myself. And um, I think what we're really looking for is people the way that we think about it is in a time like this, you have to play a real balance between offense and defense. Um, and you have to find leaders that are really able to find the opportunity, find the offense in a situation like this. You always have to be defensive and protective, like, you know, extend cash flow, you know, um, cut down burn, you know, do certain preventative measures to make sure, you know, secure up your supply chain. These are all defensive activities. But the truly successful leaders, I think, in times like this are the ones that are able to take these moments and say, well, you know, a whole bunch of chips are down. 
but let's find opportunity. Let's figure out how we're going to take this and create something out of it and build something out of it, something positive rather than everything just being negative. And I'm really proud to say that when we look across our portfolio, we've seen some incredible um, reactions, some really positive, like strong leadership reactions. If a leader walks into a room and his position is purely defensive, his whole company will come down with him. And it's very, very hard when you're in hibernation mode to come out of hibernation mode, even if the market shoots back up again. Um, but if you're able to go into a room and say, hey, the chips are down, but here's the vision, and you have a strong, you know, uh, positive, you know, proactive approach towards how you're going to deal with the situation, I, see, I can see these teams, like, step up and their heads rise, their chins rise. Yeah, and, totally. And, you know, their chests come out and, and they just start fighting the fight. And I think that's the key message is you've got to fight the fight. You can't, you can't step back into hibernation. So to me, in times like this specifically, it's that fortitude and that ability to innovate and create from, you know, make, lemon, make lemonade out of lemons. Um, that's a, a real trait that a leader kind of, you know, can drive in, in this current uh, type of environment. There's plenty of other, you know, leadership capabilities that I think are really key. But in terms of something specific to this type of environment. I think that's one of the most important. Yeah. Things. And it's interesting too, because I, I think that, you know, we've had a couple other VCs come on and talk about focus. You know, you really have to focus on, you know, that which matters most. You have to, you know, in some ways play more to that defensive side of making sure that your expenses are as tight as they can be. But it sounds really what you're talking about here is to have that defense equally met with an attitude and to bring a positive attitude and the mindset is equally as important as the line items in that sort of environment. Yeah, hundred percent. To us, the defense is just table stakes. Yeah. Like yeah, you have to, it's obvious you have to protect your dollars. You have to protect your, your underlying infrastructure, but the, it's the offense that makes the difference. So when you come out the other side of this is the people that have taken that proactive and, and, uh, you know, uh, positive position that really is going to, is going to, those, those companies are going to shine as they come out the other side of this. One of the, uh, um, interesting things or, or things that you do during your investment process that I haven't heard before is you talk about the concept of what needs to be true statements. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I've never heard that before. And I found it to be interesting because I think it's one of those things that doesn't only have to be applied to venture, but could probably be applied to other problems. So maybe talk a little bit more about, you know, why do you do those and what exactly are they? Yeah, so um, the what needs to be true concept is actually uh, really digs in in the very early stages of the analysis of the business. Um, generally, when we find a business interesting, you know, there's all these caveats of these businesses we're looking at are uh, innovative businesses. They don't just slip in a, you know, in a clean, you know, safe place in the market. And, oh, yeah, this is a given. Like, those, that, that doesn't exist. So every business that we look at um, is going to be impacted by uh, macroeconomic, macro market conditions, going to be impacted by internal business operational decisions, is going to be impacted by competition, is going to be impacted by a lot of things. And so we, we create, you know, for us as the investment committee, um, what we try and do is when we first look at these businesses, when we're beginning to get serious, we're saying, okay, we're ready to dive into real diligence now. And so there's certain questions that need to be answered to make us comfortable that this is a good investment. And so we frame them as the what needs to be true. So tell us what needs to be true that we should believe that allows us to understand the risk and the potential of these businesses. And so it's a way for us to kind of frame out, you know, what are the headwinds that they may face or rather what do we need to be true to ensure that they don't hit headwinds uh, as they grow the business and as they develop their ideas. Awesome. Now, you, you, I think I remember hearing that you guys are doing somewhere in the 8 to 12 core investments a year and about, you know, 20 to 30 feeder investments. How do you think about sourcing those sorts of deals? In fact, even better, how do VCs typically source deals in this sort of environment where you have some focus around smaller companies, some focused around bigger? What's like the, the process or the thought process around making sure that you're seeing the right sorts of companies? 
Um, so there's, there's multiple different ways to do this. Um, there's multiple different channels of sourcing. So the, the most basic ones are, um, you know, our personal networks, uh, both in terms of founder relationships as well as in terms of other GP relationships. So there's a lot of deals that come our way, which actually come to us from what we consider our, you know, tier one investors that want us to get involved in deals with them. Or even if we look at upstream investors that have done uh, seed deals that are referring us for a Series A because they they think that we you know we'd be a great investor in those businesses. And I think because of our model, a lot of um, other GPs see real value in having us in the group because they know that we will invest a lot of resources over and above any dollars into helping these companies be successful. Um, so I think those networks, so founder relationships and also other investor relationships within our own personal networks is one key way. Um, what we also do is uh, we do a lot of analysis in particular areas where we think that there's interest and we'll actually go out and actually research and identify businesses that are playing in spaces and, and just cold call out and start you know figuring out what's happening in different categories. And so that's more of your typical kind of um, uh, lead sourcing. Type. I loved uh, I loved hearing about what you guys do on a quarterly basis, where you actually are coming together as a team to talk about well, what sort of deals maybe did we pass on that we might want to think about for yeah. next quarter. And I just what I love the most about you guys is you've really built a lot of these small processes that would be very you know they're very operational, heavy, very entrepreneurial uh, driven. Even, you know, the things like your, um, the startup story arc that you guys have created for each startup. Do you want to, you know, tell people a little bit more about that concept and how it plays into your overall thesis? Yeah, we look at, we look at companies, we kind of range from a scale of zero to six and zero being inception, six being growth. So there's all the stages in between. And we, what we try and do is we try and identify where in the, every company has a unique story arc, but there's certain commonality that they all go through. So they all have a problem solution. They all have a minimal viable product. They all have to demonstrate product market fit and validate that. They all have to start figuring out their growth channels. Um, these are all things that every company has to think about. And so what we try and do is we try and identify where on that curve these companies live. And this actually helps us even more so in the post-investment period. Totally. Where we're saying, how do we push them up that J curve? How do we actually think about, here's a company that's got product market fit, but they haven't figured out how to actually grow, how to actually scale, you know, how to think about, um, you know, growth channels and things like that. Okay, so we understand now very clearly the step we need to help them take in order to have them grow to the next stage of their business. And in some cases, oh, sorry, I was going to say, and that, sorry, that like that to me is what's so cool about your overall thesis and around having a platform as opposed to just being an investment, because there's a lot of VC funds right now that are building out platform. You know, they they have that as a as a part of their actual business, but just having platform is one. You know, it's a it's a nice area. It's a nice thing to say. But the word platform should really be driven around problems and trying to help solve those problems. And if you're taking the time at the very beginning to think about where where in the story arc is this investment, then you can actually use the platform to solve that problem. It's not just something to have, but it's actually integral into the overall storyline of the of the startups. And I think yeah. that's what's so cool as an outsider learning about you guys, yeah. because you know, my problems today are different than what they were six months ago or different than what they were two years ago. And knowing that there's VC that thinks about that as a objective, holistic approach, super cool. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I think one of the key things to also note is we recognize that every company has a unique story. Arc. So there are commonalities we're identifying, but one of the most important things is we're not trying to create a, you know, one size fits all solution. That's not healthy for any company and it's it's going to be frustrating for any founder because every founder is going to say hey I'm, I'm unique you know i'm i'm what i am and so we we are very uh you know we 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 try and provide a very personalized approach for the individual team for the individual business um and use the story arc as a guidepost mm -hmm. of where we think they are but you know, product market fit for one company can be very different to product market fit for another. And so we have to recognize the differences as much as we recognize the similarities. Now, one question that we always get asked about is, you know, MBA is a constant uh, question. Should you go to MBA? Is Does it matter in MBA? So I guess my first question for you is, 
what did you take away from your MBA program that you didn't expect going into it? Um, I, my MBA was phenomenal. It was the best, uh, best education I had. Um, I, uh, what I had done, my MBA was really two years of realization of all the things I did. I thought I knew, but I didn't. And I think it was the, the key point in my career. And luckily it happened early enough in my career where I realized that I, I have so much to learn and everybody does, even at this stage in my career, you know, you always have so much to learn. And so, um, whereby everything prior to that was really driven by gut and just by instinct. And luckily I, I, you know, got away with that and maybe I had decent instincts, but I just got away with it. You know, what, what ended up happening is it's the blend, the combination of, of instinct and, and knowledge and experience. So three things really instinct, which just comes naturally. People either have it or don't, you can hone your instinct over, over a career, but you know, some people naturally have it and some people have a hard time building instinct. Another one, uh, you know, the second one, which is the education is the knowledge is how many books you've read, how many stories, you know, how many case studies you understand, you know, the basic fundamentals of, of, you know, marketing theory, finance theory, all these different things, that's your knowledge. And then the final piece is experience. Experience just comes over years. You, you don't get that. And I think that's one thing also I realized when I did my MBA is that I had, I now had a knowledge. I had, I felt like I had decent instincts, but I still didn't have the experience that I thought it would take to build, um, you know, a true career, uh, you know, in, in, as an entrepreneur, as an operator. And so I think it's a critical component. I think you can learn on the job, but it does take a lot longer and you will make a lot more mistakes. Mm -hmm. Um, some of these fundamentals, uh, that's just what they are. They're just fundamentals and you just have to kind of have them in your back pocket. And some of these things you can learn in your undergrad, depending on what undergrad you've done. But for me personally, the MBA was one of the best experiences I had and, and just gave me so much ammunition mm. when I came out the other side to put kind of theory into practice and, and really realize, um, you know, a lot of the basics of business that I, I, I was really just guessing at before. Now, so I, I would recommend it. I, I also think, by the way, timing is key for individuals. So after a certain amount of real world experience, you kind of cover off on an MBA. So at a certain point in, in someone's career, maybe do a short executive MBA program, but not necessarily, people don't necessarily need to do the full two year MBA. But I think where I was in my mid to late twenties, where I had really just kind of was still establishing myself, um, it was a really, really good time to do that, and the education was invaluable. So there's probably a lot of entrepreneurs, myself included, that feel like they have the grit, the sales, the heart, the you know, the natural go getter. What what did you get out of the MBA for that sort of person, right? Because you were very much sales driven. You're you know, you're very gut and, and instinct driven. So what are, were there specific skills, whether it be in the finance or like, what was the areas that you remember thinking to yourself, like, okay, I'm really, I feel like I now have that knowledge that you didn't have before. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the key thing is before my MBA, everything, I didn't have any theory to back up my approach. So everything that we were looking at, when we were looking at our go to market or looking at the way we were building our, you know, financial planning and all these things, I was just trying to use logic to to figure out how to actually get that done. So I didn't have any frameworks. I didn't have any structure. It was just, okay, let's think about this problem and instinctively try and solve for that. And most people with good instincts and good gut and good, you know, go-getter attitude will figure that mm -hmm. out. And they just might the, have to fail a bunch that, of times in order to get there, right? Yeah, right. exactly. And they won't be working off of theory. So they'll just be basically kind of working off of logic. And that's great. You need that. Because even with the theory, if you don't have that, you still are missing a big chunk, right? So post-MBA, every time I saw a problem, I was able to begin to navigate either case studies or theories or frameworks or constructs that apply to that particular problem set. And it just allowed, it made the process of resolving problems a lot faster, a lot easier. And the process of bringing people along the journey a lot easier as well. So when you're bringing your whole team along, now when you have kind of pre-constructed frameworks that you can use to communicate with the team, then again, it's much easier for the teams to kind of uh, ingest those and to, to follow your lead. So mm -hmm. 
I don't think it in any way replaces the go-getter attitude, the instinct, the gut, you know, all the things you were talking about. You have to have that. But what it does is it gives you a framework by which you can structure that, explain that, communicate that to other people. Cool. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate that, Carl. Now, when you are... Uh, having all of these investments, I think I heard that you see almost 1500 or even more companies per year. Is there a specific type of company that when they walk in the front door or uh, sign into a zoom call that you're like, yes, like this is what what gets you really excited right now? Like of all of the different types of tech, are there any that you feel sort of is like, makes you feel comfortable and excited uh, in particular right now? Um. Let's see. So uh, it's it's a wide question because we do see a wide array of things, and we are actually looking at a wide array of different uh, technologies and areas where we, where you know we find uh, excitement. Uh, it's difficult to identify a single category and say, "Hey, this category gets us excited," because it really depends on the individual business. We've got some interesting investments in um, you know in communications, uh, voice communications specifically that we think are really really interesting in the way that voices you know, beginning to, uh, to become the shortcut with AirPods and, and uh, other technologies that are kind of making voice easier to access for people when they're, you know, on their phone or just walking in the street. So using voice to, to replace some, you know, video or websites, things like that is becoming a really interesting uh, approach towards how consumers, you know, ingest information. Mm-hmm. So where we've invested in and we look at a number of companies that are kind of using voice for that. Um, we think data companies that are really building off of the value of data and creating value for customers based upon data. Uh, and that comes in so many different yeah. forms that we think that's huge right now and uh, is just uh, an incredible, uh, you know, creates incredible insights that that people just never had before about themselves, about the environment around them, about decisions they need to make. So data-driven uh, technologies are really exciting for us too. Um, I think if we look longer horizon, AR, VR, you know, this whole kind of immersive life um, is, is uh, we've got a couple of investments in there. And that's a, that's a really exciting longer term view. We think that there are some big, big opportunities, but on a much longer horizon, because there's still a lot of adoption that needs to take place in that space. I was, uh, and then also, oh, go on, go on, go please, please. I was just going to say, last one I was going to mention was um, things around mental wellness uh, and uh, kind of the ability to help people, uh, especially in a time like now, but to help people through um, in a mental wellness, whether it's uh, physical hardware solutions or whether it's other types of software solutions tends to be a, a pretty interesting category as well for us. On the point of mental wellness, not necessarily from an investment perspective, but just from like a personal routine perspective, uh, I could imagine that, you know, your job, while you're not necessarily in the trenches with every single startup, there's still a lot of stress and you feel a lot of empathy for them. Do you have any routines that you yourself use to kind of take you from a place of being really anxious or having a lot of stress that works for you to kind of calm yourself down or any sort of routines that you found to work for you in particular? Yeah, um, <laughs> I have uh, I have come to learn that I am a very calm person. It takes a lot for me to get rattled, and having been through a couple of pretty major crises with my own companies and hundreds of employees, um, it kind of teaches you that. But uh, um, I tend to always I'm an optimist, and I tend to always think about the opportunity rather than the the damage. And so what I will do in in times of stress is I'll always take a step back and breathe, kind of get myself out of the problem and then relook at it again from a much bigger picture and just starting start thinking about, you know, the whole macro environment around that particular company or that particular problem. And uh, it, it makes it much easier for me to to approach problems in a, you know, definitely in a more relaxed mm. um, mindset. I, I really feel that, you know, knee jerk is everybody's worst enemy, uh, definitely an operator's worst enemy, definitely an investor's worst enemy. And so never, ever react right off of immediate receipt of information, always take a breath. And when I say take a breath, I mean, literally like sit there, take a breath, step back and then calm your mind and then think about, okay, strategically, what are we doing here? And so I, I don't know if I have a very particular method 
it's just really as simple as, as that, just kind of having the self-awareness to understand that I am getting into a place where I'm going to make a bad decision. Let me step back, breathe, and try and get myself back to a place where I can think logically and strategically. I feel like that's something, at least I'm seeing it in my own personal growth. You know, I'm, I'm just 32, so I'm still, I'm still trying to build it, but I feel like that's really tied to that experience, that like you've been through these experiences where you realize, oh, when I need jerk reaction, this was, you know, that relationship didn't go the way I wanted yeah. to, or that investment didn't go. And over time, you just, you recognize that statement that when you make that charged up emotional decision, it almost never goes as well as it could if you just take a step back. And it's interesting because it's one of those things that's like quite literally one step back in a breath can have such a big impact on the entire situation. Um, yeah, yeah. It's just the slight pause. And what's interesting is even working with founders and, and other leaders, you can recognize immediately if what they're doing is, is knee jerk. And so being able to just step in and say, hey, hold on, wait mm. a minute, before you make a rash decision, let's take a breath and let's have a conversation about what's happening. And uh, it's, ha you know, you can see it happening here and there. And, and it's actually uh, really satisfying to go through that with, with a founder that you have a lot of respect for and a lot of belief in and see them evolve their thinking and come to a better ultimate strategy, a better ultimate decision, because you've helped them step away from the moment in which they're, they're you know, potentially making a bad decision. Which, um, so which is something that you've said before is really like one of the key red flags that you try to stay away from is uncoachable founders. Because you know, if they're not listening to their customers, if they're not able to continue to evolve, if they're not able to grow, then they're not the sort of person that you want to be working with. Yeah, yeah. And, and honestly, you know, you're going to have um, uncoachable founders that find success. But I think if you actually look at the overall statistics, you're going to find that that actually probably drives failure um, far more often than success. Um, and I love the way that you frame it. It's not just about listening to mentors or listening to me or anybody specific it's about listening to your customers listening to your you know the people around you you know taking in guidance and support and not feeling like you have all the answers every day of your life because nobody yeah. does uh, you know there's always going to be situations where no matter who you are you're stumped and you just need to sit back and think and, and consult with people to be able to you know clarify your thinking and your mind and, and what you need to do in those situations. Yeah. And for anyone that's listening that didn't get this from earlier in, in this podcast with Carl, what's cool about M13 is they actually have almost like an entire uh, community of these professionals and these executives in different spaces that not only help them think about their investments, but also, you know, can offer that hand, can give that advice. Um, and, you know, it's really cool, like no matter where you are in your story arc, you can get help in different ways uh, from the M13 community. Um, Carl, one of the... Well, let, let me just, yeah, please. Sure, let me just clarify that real quick because I just want to make it really clear what it is. Yeah, so yeah. We have our investment team and then next to it, we have what we call our propulsion team. And it's a group of partners um, that are very specific to key vertical areas of expertise. They've all been in multiple companies, seen exits, seen incredible growth. Like these are people that... Uh, any company, you know, would cover the opportunity to have them in their team. It's an incredible group of people. And that group of people, they actually work, their partners in M13. So they're, you know, they work alongside us every day, uh, alongside the rest of the team every day. And, uh, and they're focused on helping founders achieve success as much as the investors are focused on, you know, making investments in high potential opportunities this team is focused on helping the founders achieve success and different, you know, scenarios require different sets of skills. So if it's a data issue, we have a data strategist, we have a talent lead, we have a comms and branding lead, we have a marketing lead. You know, there are specific people that just have incredible resumes that just can come in and be a part of the think tank that helps these companies find the right solution. So just to clarify what that yeah. is, that's, that's kind of how it lives in the, the propulsion team. That's so cool. Um, yeah. Now, Carl, one of my favorite questions to ask is around books and education. So if you were to recommend one or two books to me that you said, Sean, you've got to read this, you've got to pick it up. Have there been any books yeah. that like you find yourself recommending often or you just love giving away? Uh, it doesn't necessarily even have to be business or leadership books, but ones that uh, kind of have popped their head up 
you know, every so often and you really uh, think about. Well, I'm going to get a shout out to my partners, Carter and Courtney Rian for uh, their book, uh, Shortcut Your Startup. But uh, that, that, that would be self-serving. Good, so, good, good, good. Um, <laughs> let me think. I think if I just, uh, if I think about it um, and I'm trying to break it up into different uh, reasons. So let's say there's, I'll give you three books. Okay. Um, one book, which is just really insightful and just uh, conceptually just really helps you kind of think about negotiation and think about how to deal with people. It's a book called Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Love that book. I believe he was a, he was, you've read yeah. that book. He's a, he was a negotiator for the FBI and, and he, uh, he just really, really breaks down so many of the fundamentals of how people think and how people react and how to kind of navigate a negotiation. I, I find that a fascinating book and really helpful in, in kind of day-to-day -day business. And then there are two books, one book, which is more general about how to build long lasting businesses. And that's good to great by Jim Collins. Um, and I really like that because it's not a flash in the pan book and it just gives kind of these constructs of how people can actually build businesses that last. And then if I think of a book that's very specific to a particular um, experience, it's probably uh, The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz. So Ben was the, uh, you know, Andreessen invested in DigitalOcean, and so we were very tied to them for a number of years. And uh, that book and understanding the history of, of uh, what they did, you know, the hard times, the easy times, kind of all the stories of, of a true um, entrepreneurial experience, I think is really enlightening for anybody that's kind of going into that world. That's awesome. So those are probably three yeah. that I've those are those are staples. Uh, all three on the bookshelf of the Coefficient Labs team. So okay. I uh, I think that's awesome. Sure. <laughs> um, Carl, what are you most excited about right now? What What are you just most pumped up about, personal or business? Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I think um, the things that most excite me are the things that I haven't seen yet, the things I haven't learned yet. It's all the things I don't know. Um, and it's the discovery, you know, on a regular basis of just the aha moments, uh, what excite me all the time. And I think we live in a world, we live in a space, um, specifically M13, where we are just exposed to so many new, uh, new things, whether it's um, different ways in which people run businesses or different technologies or whatever it might be. Like all that newness is what really excites me. And um and I have to say, you know, shout out to my family. I'm, I'm super excited about the potential. I have two daughters and that babies, one's three, one's one. And just every day I'm excited about the potential and, and what they could become and what their lives will hold for them. And, you know, that's on a very personal note, something that definitely kind of excites me every day. Well, Carl, sending so much love to you and your family uh, during this time. Uh, this was amazing podcast. Thank you so much for giving us, uh, you know, some of your time. and. For people that want to connect with you on the socials or, you know, learn more about you guys, what's the best way to get in contact with you? Uh, LinkedIn uh, or, you know, I'm also pretty active um, uh, on Instagram, either through the M13 company or through Calamar NYC um, on Twitter as well. But uh, LinkedIn's probably my most active. Plan. Beautiful. Carl, again, thank you so much. Everyone, I'm Sean Goldfaden, CEO of Coefficient Labs. This is Demo Day. Hey.